think we can start slowly uh, today. Um, the main the main topic is really to continue with uh, with entanglement, um, and, and there are many things about it. It's really been an active field for the last uh, 15, 20 years, and there's a lot to be said about it. So I have to be a little bit more uh, judicious, I suppose, in this side what to pick out and not to bore you with certain things. Yesterday I said the main the main problem with Bell's inequalities initially, not with Bell's, with entanglement in general, was really that, um, that um, it implied some kind of non-locality, in spite of the fact that we know that quantum mechanics is local in the, in the usual sense that I discussed. Um, and I said the argument by EPR, I'll just repeat that, that was the last thing I really, I really said um, yesterday. The argument of EPR was, in some sense, um, I have the state 0, 0, plus 1, 1. And if the particles are very far apart, um, uh, then, then relativity at least um, rules out the possibility that something travels between the two particles during me measuring them. So if you, again, it's always the condition that your measurement on one of the particles should be faster than anything that, uh, that can be communicated between the two, just to rule out any, any physical effect. Um, and then the argument of EPR was I can actually violate Heisenberg's uncertainty. Um, you can take either of the particles, it's symmetric. So basically, there, you know, uh, you could say Alice can measure in, in the 0, 1 basis, and she can therefore know the value of the sigma z uh, of Bob because they are perfectly correlated. Uh, but surely, if her measurement is quick, and they're far apart, the fact that she collapsed the state to 0 and 1 should not have propagated to him. And now Bob measures the complementary direction, the x direction, and now he gets plus or minus 0, plus 1, or 0, minus 1. And so suddenly we've got both of these. She can now phone him up and she can say, I've got sigma z equal 1. Um, and he can say, oh, nice, I've got sigma x equals plus. So we've got sigma z and sigma x in spite of the non-commutativity of these two operations. It's very interesting. Um, and actually, I'll take a very small digression now just to say a little bit more about this non-commutativity. Because what I have to say now is a kind of reply to EPR uh, much more properly, I think, than, uh, than what I said before did. Of course, Paul was rushing to, to reply to rescue quantum mechanics as if, uh, as if it needs any rescue in some sense. But, but basically, the point is that you have to be very careful um, when you talk about quantum mechanics in general and what's allowed. And if you stick to the formulation that we keep talking about, which is, I do something here to make something in my lab. Then I let that something evolve in the most general way, and then I do something else to extract the information about that. It's always like that. We physicists call this preparation, evolution, and measurement. And everything, again, is of that form in quantum mechanics. So there's a very beautiful problem called the mean king problem, which is a parallel game, in some sense, to uh, to understanding entanglement. And it, it's led to lots of concepts, I think, like mutually unbiased basis and things like that. And, and the problem in its formulation goes like this. So there is a mean king. Let's say King Arthur was an extremely mean guy. And, and he catches his wife, Lady Guinevere, cheating on him with his knight, Sir Lancelot. OK, so it's a very well-known love story between Sir Lancelot and Arthur's wife. And Arthur is not very happy about it, and he wants to punish his wife in some sense. So he's got the Excalibur, he's ready to chop her head off. But he doesn't want to appear to be too nasty, and he wants to still kind of maintain his nice image with all the other people in the country. So he says to her, I'll give you a way out if you can answer the following question. I have a spin half system with me. So, <laughs> so King Arthur was uh, very fond of popular quantum physics. He read a lot about, uh, about quantum mechanics. 
and he says, I've got this guy, and I'm going to make a measurement, and you're guessing already what he's going to measure, sigma z or sigma x. I'm going to choose, you will not know what I choose, either sigma x or sigma z. And what I want you to do is to tell me uh, the outcome of this measurement, no matter what it is. If you make a mistake, so he's being very nasty because he read some of the uncertainty principle. He read that these guys cannot be simultaneously determined. And of course now he's appearing to be nice to people who don't know quantum mechanics, but uh, to anyone else it's clear that his wife has got to die. And then, of course, he still loves Guinevere. And of course, he doesn't really understand quantum mechanics properly, as we do. So he says to her, to her okay, I'll give, you, I'll give you a little bit of leeway. I'll allow you to hold the spin half initially before I measure it. Then you give it to me, then I measure it in some way. Then I give it back to you, and then I ask you the question. So he's very much in love with her still after 20 years of marriage. He says to her, you hold it initially, I measure it, you hold it again. And the amazing thing is Guinevere, if she plays it right, never dies. Now she can always answer the question, even though she does not know what her husband is going to measure. EPR kind of stuff. But she doesn't use entanglement. This is without entanglement. But it actually now goes a little bit deeper into the quantum mechanics of things. So the question this is the mean thing for And the question is, what does she need to do? Any guesses? What should she do initially, and what should she do finally? She should prepare the heat temperature stream state. And uh, after, she should measure it in, a, in another you would live. Yes. You would live. Really. Yeah. So basically, yes, and you can generalize this to, to higher spin as well, which is why the whole uh, field developed there. But then you had to worry about what the complementary basis is and all of these things, and that's where the mutually unbiased basis comes in. So what Guinevere has to do is prepare the prepare the spin in an eigenstate of one of the two, sigma z or sigma x, doesn't matter. So let's say she really prepares the z basis and she prepares state zero. Then she gives it to her husband. If her husband measures in that basis, he's got to get zero. And when he gives it back to her and asks, uh, what's the value of sigma z, she will know that it's zero because she prepared it. Then she gets lucky. If he measures x, of course that's a bit problematic because now he's going to get either state plus or minus, 0 plus 1 or 0 minus 1. But of course he's kind enough and ignorant of the true meaning of quantum mechanics and the uncertainty relations and he gives it back to them. So at the end if she measures exactly like you said in the x basis, then she will know the outcome that he got here because she's got to get the same outcome that he did. So if you have access to the preparation of your system and subsequently the final preparation of the measurement of your system, then you can actually measure, you can tell, now I'm using a foul language because you're not really violating anything, but it looks as though you can answer definitively the state of spin in both x and z. There is no contradiction here. This is quantum mechanics. This is not, uh, there's no entanglement there. Either. But you can see that with entanglement, it is a little bit like this. Because the first measurement here is a little bit like the first preparation. And the second measurement by Bob is like Guinevere getting the spin back and measuring it again. And actually, that's it. So EPR is dead in some sense. In, in the sense that quantum mechanics is okay. So I'm giving, in a way, the same reply as Paul. There is no inconsistency. Uh, there may be some spiritual inconsistency, depending how you interpreted quantum mechanics in your head, but there is nothing wrong with the formalism. and it really is like that. <coughs> so, of course, another way of saying this, mathematically speaking, is that what's unusual about entanglement here is 
is that this state, if you rotate it to the plus minus basis, looks exactly the same. And you have to go into another basis to see that there is something unusual. If, if you always stay in the 0, 1 basis, then this state is as correlated as any classically correlated state. So you know, if I wrote the state 0, 0 with some probability, let's say half and 1, 1, and this is a completely separable state. It's a mixture of two states that are not at all correlated. Then if you stay within the Z basis, you can never tell the difference between these two. I'm leading into Bell's inequalities and why you need to construct them in the way you do. So you need to measure in some other basis. It's not enough to do the Z measurements. You need to measure in the X basis. And then you will see that the state plus, 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 and minus, 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 if you like, is not the same state as this guy. Whereas quantum mechanically, you get exactly the same, the same guy. So that's what's unusual. And now I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit about what Bell did. So Bell somehow turned all of these puzzles and, and, uh, and apparent paradoxes into, into, into a number. And it's really, it's, it's, it probably was the biggest breakthrough in terms of, in terms of foundations of quantum mechanics. Um, so what, what, what was his reasoning? His reasoning was, I need to allow Alice and Bob to measure complementary uh, bases. Um, it, it turns out actually that um, that for maximum violation, you don't go from Z into X, but you go between um, exactly halfway between X and Z, and that for some reason gives you the maximum violation of Bell's inequalities. The X and Z themselves will also give you something that classical physics cannot achieve, but it's not going to be the maximum. So what Bell said is. Um, and so what Bell said is, is, is the best thing is let's give two, he didn't quite say this, he did it with, with fewer things, but, but this is what it turned out to be ultimately. Um, he said let's, let's have two measurements on Alice's side, let's have two measurements, and they are now projected measurements. You can also ask yourself what happens if I turn this into, into a CP map in general and have more outcomes and so on. And that's also possible, you can construct your own Bell's inequalities in this way. Uh, I don't know how much of it has been done either. Um, so basically what, what he does now is he says each of these is a binary uh, variable dichotomic as, as, as some people call it. They have, they have basically two outcomes uh, only. And then he said if I combine it in a, in a very smart way, and this is what, uh, what took a little bit of thinking, I guess that's the major, major contribution that he made. I think it was either made on a Saturday or on a Sunday. That's a safe bet because Bell was a high energy physicist and he did quantum physics foundations for fun. He wasn't allowed to do that at CERN. He had to calculate, shut up and calculate non-stop. And then on weekends, he would, uh, it's like, you know, he would become uh, his uh, alter ego, I suppose, like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, and uh, and the Mr. Hyde was the guy who derived uh, this kind of stuff. So now, how did he, what did he say? He said, Imagine all of this is statistical simply because quantum mechanics only allows you to extract averages and so you have to build up your statistics. Um, it's very difficult to do this with a single shot. Although there are interesting things you can do with a single shot and we'll go into that as well. So now imagine that these guys uh, share lots of these pairs of, uh, of, uh, of entangled particles. And then what, what Bell said is, is, here is what I'm going to construct. Um, Alice is going to measure either A1 or A2, and she can choose randomly just to play it completely fair to, our, to rule out any conspiracy. And so will Bob. And then at the end of the whole game, they will get together and compute a certain operator. And this is this intelligently constructed so-called Bell operator, I suppose, which is, um, Combine them like that, and and there is if you have never seen this before, there is a, there is something that looks a little bit unusual, which is this minus. So everything is combined with a plus sign, other than the last uh, product. This, this is really literally a product of the outcomes of the measurements on on, on A's and B's. So so Bell said, um, if in in every instance you will get some number out. So on the first, Alice may choose to measure A1 and she will get the result 1 out. And Bob may choose B2 and he will get minus 1 out or whatever. So he assumed that 
the numbers that they get are, are plus one for state up and minus one for state down. Zero is fine as well. It just works, works out more nicely, I would say. So now, why is this something that, that, that's going to discriminate quantum mechanics from, from, uh, from classical physics? And the answer is that um, the answer is that classically there is a very simple logic to show that this cannot exceed the value of two or minus two. It cannot be smaller than minus two. And then quantum mechanically, when you calculate the average, you will get something else. And it, it looks like um, sleight of hand actually when you looks like a magician's trick when you when you do it for the first time. So the logic is like this: um, I'm, I'm going to pull out a one uh, factor out. Um, and then I'm going to factor out um, A2 from the, from the second two guys. So this is the same. This is just a, an algebraic identity. And, and now you, you argue that, that since all of these guys can either be plus or minus one, if I want to maximize this, I can make this sum up to two by giving them value one each, but then this is going to be zero. This is a discrete variable. Or I can make this guy equal to 1, but then this guy is going to be 0. So there is no way that you can make, do anything other than 2 or minus 2 by the same, by the same logic. So whichever, you do, whichever way you do this, when you average, given that for any instance this cannot be more than 2 or less than minus 2, on average also, when you compute the average of this quantity, uh, the absolute value, if you like to use the shorthand notation, cannot exceed number two. Since there is no way that this can happen. It's interesting because, because this is like a two-line derivation of something that's actually completely false in practice. And, and now you can stare at it and you can say, where did you make a mistake? I mean, what, what exactly did you do that's illegal? So Bell said if you... Um, so, you know, if you, if you compute the average now quantum mechanically, then you can get 2 times root 2 on the other side. So that's why I said initially in one of the first lectures that 1 plus 1 is 2 times square root 2, uh, which is the quantum logic of, of this type. So, so where exactly did I go wrong? I mean, how can I exceed this number? And, and I, I made one very, very important assumption that I glossed over there, um, which actually uh, is, is, makes all the difference in the world there. And you will see in a, in a second what I did when I, when I start doing it now, quantum mechanically. So if you want to calculate the average of an operator like this quantum mechanically, actually let me do it here. So if I want to do an average of A1, B1, A1, B2, and so on, um, What this is definitely equal to is, is, is the average of each of these terms. So I'm not going to make any mistake by doing that. That's all fine. Linearity is there always, <coughs> trace expression, and that's all fine. But now I want to factor out A1 from this expression. And what I have to imagine for that uh, scenario is a world in which the average of a product is the same as the product of averages. And of course, this is not true. So that's what I was doing there when I, when I cheated on you and I did something that's illegal. Um, if this is true, as it is for separable states, disentangled states, then you have no problem, because now you run exactly the same argument as the last line there. I factor A1 average out, and so on, A2 average out, and then indeed, this cannot be greater than or equal on in the absolute value than 2. So it's a very simple statistical statement that the average of a product of two observables is not the same as the as the product of averages. Of course, Bell, the way that Bell phrased it is he looked at, and I think this relates now to these debates when you, when you go to, a, to, a, to, a, to, to your run-of-the-mill uh, quantum mechanics conference where people talk about locality and reality all the time. So 
why do we use this language? You see, I present it to you in a, in a kind of modern perspective that uh, I don't really go into ideological statements about uh, whether the world is real or not real or whatever else. Uh, but of course, in Bell's sense, this had a very, this had a very, very precise meaning. So the meaning is the following. Um, what, uh, another way, not, not this way, of justifying the derivation is to say the following. I'm going to assume that the particles have a defined values of A1 and A2 in the same way that the mean king was playing the game, independently of the measurement that I make here. So this guy really has a hidden variable there, as Bell called it. And this hidden variable is like a classical number that you don't know to start with, but basically you will get to know it by measuring A1 and A2. And somehow there is a certain non-invasive assumption there, assumption there on this variable in the sense that when I measure it, I don't really disturb. I just uncover the value. I don't change that value. So that you're trying to capture classical physics. And this certainly is a property of classical physics. But the beauty of Bell is that he was looking at any theory where this could be true. So, you know, Einstein's gravity is not a classical Newtonian physics, but it is classical in the sense of Bell's inequalities. And so you're ruling out many theories that have this property, not just, not just, so it's not just that you're confirming quantum mechanics uh, against uh, Newtonian, but you're ruling out any theory where you are allowed to do these kind of things. Second assumption, that Bell had to make. So the first was reality assumption. Reality again just means there is a value there, I just happen not to know it. Like, a, like Exactly like classical statistical mechanics, some probability distribution. The second statement that Bell made, and he needed this statement so that he could factor out this guy here, is the following. When you do these averages, here A1 is measured when B1 is measured. Here A1 is measured when B2 is measured on the other side. How do you know that the value of A1 will be the same in both of these expressions? Again, if you look at it as a mathematical statement, it is the same A1. But if you interpret it as a physical measurement, how do I know that my measurement outcome here will not be different if you do something else on the other side? Hence locality. If you assume that relativity is correct, these two numbers are one and the same. And that allows the guy to factor the number out. If, if in this case you have plus one and here minus one, then actually you can do whatever you like. You can get, by the way, four here. Not two root two. So two root two, if you are a little bit more mathematically minded, is smaller than four by quite a bit, larger than two. And actually you can go all the way up to four if you're allowed to fiddle not locally with things like that. It's also interesting. Um, so now Bell had reality and he had locality. And this is one of those debates, actually, as we talked about, which people interpret in the following way. The fact that Bell's inequalities are ruled out, that they are basically violated by quantum mechanical systems, means that one of the two assumptions of Bell's are actually incorrect. <coughs> and now you've got a choice as a physicist or as a human being. Do you believe that the world is non-local, i.e. relativity is violated, or do you believe that the world is unreal, i.e. there are no hidden variables in the sense that they exist independently of the measurements that you make? And here is a nice choice for all of us, okay? So are you a surrealist or are you a non-localist or whichever else uh, this would imply. So that's why we, usually people, funnily enough, I would say if you really talk to, to most of the practitioners, I think we're pretty happy with relativity and I think lots of us will be very, very reluctant to give that up, which means that you don't believe in the reality independently of your measurement, which in other words means you believe in superpositions, really, that you can rotate things and so on. Which, which is true. Uh, but, but usually people talk about entanglement as being non-locality. So that's interesting. 
but that would really correspond to the to the emotion that you want the world to be real in a sense everything is out there even even though you don't really measure it and then and then of course what what seems to be the case is that something travels faster than the speed of light although we can never use this for any communication as we proved previously so that's the that's the whole debate i think it explains a little bit this debate uh, between these two issues and then probably the most recent development in this direction was uh, by Tony Leggett, who, who said, well, Bell tells you that you're, you can equally give up either of the two assumptions, because Bell's inequalities don't tell you which one is more likely to fail than the other. But then he constructed another set of inequalities, slightly different, but very similar logic, combining different measurement operators. And basically, he was trying to go towards ruling out reality more than towards ruling out reality, uh, locality. And again, lots of you know that, uh, that there, there is a whole direction of cohen Speher paradox and whatever else where actually you don't even use two different parties, you just use one particle and you are trying to rule out hidden variables that they pre-exist independently of your measurements. So all of these guys are somehow related. And I would say we pretty much now have enough evidence that, that uh, you shouldn't bet too much money on, on any hidden variable, local hidden variable theory in this sense. So I think we know that this is ruled out, we know that quantum mechanics is okay. And so now you can either take this uh, archaic language as it is, and you can say it plays a certain role uh, historically, um, or you can of course go and try to develop certain other tests and so on, but I think it's, it's, it's pretty much dubious what the value of that is. Uh, and I think all of this really tells us that we are pretty confident that quantum mechanics is the way it is. And even though it's unusual, we really have to just take it and, and go along with that. So now, um, what I want to do is, is in a way really fast forward. So of course, after Bell's paper, there were, there were lots, of, uh, lots of tests of these guys. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I think that takes you from 19 whatever, 63 or 64. Um, down to maybe 1991, 2, 3, 4, 5. So basically early 90s when people started to play some other games. And that, that was very interesting actually. So, so it's these other games that I really want to start telling you about. So what was, what was, interesting, uh, what was interesting then is the following. Th there was then another <coughs> extremely weird paper, uh, which this was in 1994. Which, which actually seem to now uh, do something that should not be allowed uh, according to the law, uh, laws of logic in some sense, not even quantum mechanics. So basically, um, there was a paper by, by a guy called Gizan, whom I mentioned I think yesterday already, who said, I'm going to show you something extremely unusual. And what he did is the following. He started with a mixed state that doesn't violate Bell's inequalities. So according to that, there is a local, fully realistic model, i.e. classical probability distributions, that actually uh, can, um, can model this fully. Incidentally, if you don't allow entanglement, then the resulting theory, the resulting quantum mechanics without entanglement, is a local, uh, realistic uh, theory. So, for example, if all you ever allow Alice and Bob is to have a state rho Alice, tensor product rho Bob, only that, no correlations, then you can see that the trace of A cross B that they will measure is really just the product of this guy times this guy and this guy times that guy. So this guy will become exactly equal to that guy. And then you say, what, what, if I, what if I put an index i and I correlate these guys with some probability distribution? This is this separable state, not entangled still, but correlative. And then you say, what difference does it make? I show you that for every i, this guy is between 2 and minus 2. So on average, it still has to be between 2 and minus 2. So a state like that is a perfectly valid local, local realistic theory. After all, a density matrix is a square box on a piece of paper. 
what more beautiful hidden variable would you like? I mean, it's a density matrix. I can write it down. Here it is. I give you all the numbers there. It is an unusual hidden variable in some sense, but it is a hidden variable. And they're local for A and for B. So states like this never, never violate Bell's inequalities. But what Jisan did is he said, I'm going to take a maximally, I'm going to take a maximally uh, entangled state, and I'm going to mix it with a state that's not entangled. I think actually he took something that's non maximally entangled in a sense, let's call it state psi is some coefficient a0, 1 plus b, 1, 0. And then he said, I'm, my memory is very bad on this, but that's spiritually how it goes. I, I will show you actually what the logic is in a much uh, simpler instance. And then he said, I will, I, will, I will mix this together, so I will give some coefficient lambda for this state psi, and then I will give some, the remaining part I will give to a product state, like 0, 0. So I've got entanglement with some probability, and if your lambda is smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, at some stage you hit the boundary where you can no longer exceed the number 2 root 2. And, and at that point, you have a local hidden variable model, whatever it is. This guarantees that you do. It may not be obvious to construct. And, and what Gizan then said is, now I'm going to do something fantastic. And this really was considered initially magic. I thought there was something wrong with the paper. And in fact, uh, that's, that's more or less how I started uh, doing my, my PhD on these things, by, by seeing this paper and trying to see that uh, what's wrong with it, in some sense. And of course, there is nothing wrong with it, and the whole thing of entanglement, distillation, purification, formation, and everything else developed out of, out of just this very simple example. So, so this guy, Shizan, actually has, um, has contributed in, in, in many ways to the field, very much like people like Bennett and so on. So, so what he, what, he, what he did, all he did now is he said, again, Alice and Bob share this. Alice is going to make a local measurement, which with certain probability will give you a more entangled state. How did he do that? He basically really thought about photo, photons, and he thought about attenuating one polarization against the other one. So if you have a fiber, birefringent one in some sense, which is more likely to absorb a photon if it's vertically or horizontally polarized as opposed to the other direction, what you can do if you let the photon go through this fiber for a certain amount of time, for a certain distance, you can reduce one of these coefficients against the other one. So let's say A happens to be larger than B to start with. Then you just attenuate uh, attenuate this component here until they are equal to each other. You can calculate that if I give you A and B. And the state that then comes out is what we call the psi plus state. So if you manage to do that, which obviously I will show you actually how to do exactly, uh, with CP map and with the higher church of higher Hilbert space, if you like, which is the clearer one. If you get that state, now you're mixing a more entangled state here and you can show that the resulting state violates Bell's inequalities. So, what's the mystery? The mystery is that I started with something that admits local hidden variables. All I did is a local operation on that. And suddenly I get something non-local. How can two local things give me a non-local thing? Okay, and this he offered as a, as a paper in physics letters. This was physics letters only because this was prior to 95. After 95, this is all PRL and natures and everything else. That's when the field took off exponentially. Okay, this is Shor's algorithm time and everything else. So basically, he does that and he says this is really unusual. I mean, I shouldn't be able to do that. But actually, I do experiments on photons and I really do that. I show you that in, in practice. So the question, of course, was, was exactly how can this kind of stuff be allowed at all. all right? So that's something I will come back to next. There's one, one small point I would like to make before, before we break up. So what I will do, what I will do after break 
is I will show you how this purification of entanglement goes in general. And then I will show you actually that if you think of it not as a single copy, but if you think of it asymptotically by doing this on many <coughs> copies, then the same calculation as the one we did for Shannon's entropies and von Neumann entropies applies here to give you a measure of entanglement that's unique. And that's also very, very interesting. So now you can see that we are going very much beyond what Bell had in mind. And all of this is going to tell us that there is something more to entanglement than, than appears to be the case at first sight. Of course, the punchline which, which, which I will reveal is that the state that he started with was actually an entangled state, even though it didn't violate Bell's inequalities. So this, is, this was the realization that, that there was some entanglement, but these guys are not good enough. And that led us to the game of witnessing entanglement and things like that. So there was no, nothing paradoxical. He didn't amplify zero entanglement to finite entanglement by local means. What he did is he amplified some existing entanglement, probabilistically, but somehow he crossed the boundary of, uh, of, uh, of Bell's inequality. So in a sense, it's a very cute example, but there is nothing, nothing wrong about it. Now, the, 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 the final statement I, I wanted to make is also, is also, I think, an interesting direction. And we know a little bit about it already. And now people are probably doing uh, quite a lot of work in that direction. The mystery here is, is already the one I alluded to. Um, we've got this very funny number, 2 root 2, as the maximum violation. So a guy called Tilson proved that this, this bound is the highest you can get with two quantum bits. And so it's not 4. Because initially you could think that if I have four numbers, each of which can be plus or minus one, I can easily have plus one, plus one, plus one, minus, minus one, and I could get four out of the whole logic. Um, so you can ask yourself, why did, why did God excite us a little bit, but didn't quite give us enough power to be able to do even better things? So why did God say, I'll give you something better than classical physics? But only a little bit better, by root 2. I don't want to excite you too much and give you all four units of correlations. And physicists, we physicists always talk about knowing the mind of God. Why is the world the way it is? Why 2 root 2? No physicist is satisfied with a number that looks as funny as that. And uh, do we have an answer to that? <laughs> we don't. But we know one interesting thing, and it's the following. If you give me all four units of correlations, then there are certain tasks in computing, which I will talk about probably sometime next week or the week after, which, which normally are extremely difficult tasks to achieve. One of them is this famous coordination of diaries between two people. So I have a diary, a busy diary, you have a busy diary, and you and I have to agree on a date or a time when to meet. How do we do that if each of one of us has n entries in the diary? And the only way that we can, that we can do that is, is just like the search algorithm. It's a very slow process. Either we do it randomly, on average this is the same strategy, or we start one by one. And I say, 1st of January, are you free? You look at your 1st of January, no. 2nd of January, are you free? No. And you can see that the worst case scenario is that you're just going to be free on the, on the New Year's Eve. And that means both of us have got to, this is almost a real life example actually, with some people. And then you have to go through the whole diary and it scales very badly. If you, if you think it's basically, you don't think even in terms of n, but the fact that you can write the diary with log n bits means that this is an exponentially hard problem. Like any search, it's a really super difficult problem. Now, you give me four units of Bell's inequalities instead of two root two, I can do it in a single shot. Okay? So, in a sense, the answer to this question, the only answer I can meaningfully give it at the moment, is that God didn't want to make our life too easy. Okay? So everything would become super easy. 
all of these search problems would actually somehow reduce themselves to a single shot communication using the super correlated guys. So is, does that satisfy you? I don't know. Probably Einstein would not be very happy with this answer. There may be a deeper explanation. But this is, again, one of the very, uh, very active area. And there are people, including Gisan, who work on this uh, uh, full time nowadays. So I'll make, a, I'll make a break of 10 minutes. Uh, and, and then we'll continue with, uh, with uh, manipulations of antagonism. I wasn't sure if you made it or not. You don't have to. I have an announcement to make, actually, it's not part of the course necessarily. So, so basically, um, there, is a, there is an exciting event happening tonight that Marcelo informed me of. And, uh, and it's actually a compulsory part of the course. You are not allowed to miss this. I'll be saying things during this evening there that I will be testing on Monday morning at 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so miss it at your own peril. Um, I, there is an occasion for this, uh, for this, uh, for this uh, party. But the occasion is irrelevant. It's just an excuse to have a good time, I think. So everyone from here is invited. And I think it's a good opportunity to socialize a little bit out of, outside of the more formal context. The address is there. I will let Marcelo pronounce it. His Portuguese is slightly better, I think, than mine. <laughs> uh, the map is here as well. We have a map of the, of the place. But apparently, I'm hearing that the best thing is just to get into a, like with a group of people and share taxis today. It's it's not quite a walking distance, but it's not very expensive to get to get there. And I think if you just get in groups of four or something like that and, and take a take a taxi that's probably the easiest thing. You have to drink you have to take things to drink and to use. You have to bring some food and, and drinks and so on. And for myself and myself extra. <laughs> we'll be at the door waiting for your donation. Anyhow, I hope to see you there later on. We'll be all hanging outside around drinking beer as usual. So I think you know no one will run away for at least one hour probably after the lecture. So what I want to do now is continue a little bit with uh, with this uh, problem of Shizans and I want to show you what he really did and how he did it and, and, and that it's all nice and physical. So the logic was really that he said that he could. The, the key point is that he, did, you know, he had a mixed state and he didn't touch the, the disentangled component of that. So I don't really need to show you what happens with that guy. What I want to show you is really what happens with, uh, um, with, uh, with the other bit of that, uh, of that uh, the pure part of that. So basically, in the pure part, he had a state like, uh, like 0, 1 plus 1, 0, or 0, 0 plus 1, 1. It makes no difference. Um, but with some amplitudes, uh, 0, 0, plus 1, 1. And the question is, he wanted to get to a state with some probability, which is not 0, obviously, otherwise there's no sense. Uh, to a state 1 over root 2, 0, 0, plus 1, 1. And the question is, how do you do that, actually? Uh, and I said, I said rather kind of uh, uh, trivially, you can, you, what you have to do is attenuate the larger coefficient, reduce the amplitude. But that sounds a little bit dodgy. Like, how exactly am I going to be reducing the amplitude and still maintaining the coherence between these two? Because if I do something that's a measurement, a, a genuine projective measurement, then I'm really going to disentangle the state, and that's going to kill the whole, the whole game. So how do I do a weak measurement, which is what we talked about before as a P of EM, so that I don't really disturb things as, as much as that? And, and again, it's nice to think of it as a, think of it as a, as a physical implementation now, really. Think of these zeros and ones as, as presences and absences of, uh, of photons, for example, just to have something physical in mind. Um, and it's, this implementation would be different to the one he had in mind. He talked about polarization, so zero and one 
where the, where the two uh, degrees of uh, polarization, if you like, H and V. Um, and, and imagine that there is an atom now, so this is your ancilla. Now I'm going to extend the, the space. Imagine that you start with an, an atom in the, in the ground state, for example. <coughs> so basically, the, uh, the state here is still the same. And this atom, as usual, is only going to be on Alice's side. It's a little bit like teleportation. This guy belongs to Alice, so does this guy. And this guy is on the other side, uh, belonging to Bob. And we're not going to touch it. The atom is only going to see the first photon, if you like, or the absence of the first photon. And now you run the usual, what people call the James Cummings model, like the exchange interaction. And, and what, you do, what you do is, um, you basically, you basically interact this uh, mode of the field with this state here. And we all know, you don't have to really solve the James Cummings model to know what's going to happen. Uh, this is all now on A side. So I'll drop the indices uh, shortly. Uh, if I don't have any excitation in the atom or in the field, then of course nothing can happen. I mean, they exchange stuff, but there is nothing to exchange. So this state always stays the same state. It's an eigenstate of, of, of the guy in other words. So this is still G0. So you see, I need something that discriminates 0 from 1. That's how I'm going to attenuate the 1, 1 component or the 0, 0 component. That's the logic of this if you, if you want to know how it's constructed. And, and the G1, uh, what does that do? Well, you know, there is this Rabi frequency, and I think we'll talk about it when we, when, we, when we talk about gates. So depending on how long you let the interaction go, uh, then, then you will have something like cos omega t. Omega is the strength of the interaction, t is the time. So I'm rewriting it fully physically if you were to implement this. Um, so you know, how would you implement that? You would have two cavities prepared in, in a state like that you would shoot, so they would be entangled to start with. You'd shoot an atom through this cavity, a two-level atom, in the ground state. So, Arosh does this every time he get, gets up and has, instead of having breakfast, he does this kind of experiment. I mean, this is, this is their bread and butter, and a few other groups as well. They're, they're super difficult. It's taken him something like 25 years to enjoy his breakfast, but basically now he's doing it uh, extremely well. Um, so now he shoots an atom, and during this period when the atom is here, it starts to feel the presence or the absence of the photon. So the T, the omega is the strength of that coupling. The T is simply the time it takes this atom to go across the cavity. So it depends on the speed. They can control the speed. They can velocity select and all of these things. So there are, of course, extremely many intricacies there experimental. But all that matters to us is that... Um, this only stays G1 with certain amplitude, but it also goes coherently, it's exactly Rabi flopping, if you're familiar with that, into the exchanged state. So this is the state where the pho photon gets absorbed by the atom, the atom gets excited, the photon is lost from the cavity. So again, most of you hopefully know this kind of stuff. And so this is also on the A side. And this is a unitary transformation. So now I'm going to evolve this state and just write down the, the final state, which is just the sum of these two states. So let's see what it, this guy becomes under this kind of interaction. So you've got the first component, nothing exciting happens. It stays the way it is. Uh, G, 0, and of course Bob's uh, cavity doesn't get affected at all. Now the B side of things looks a little bit more interesting. Because G1 goes into this cos, so basically goes into cos omega t uh, G1 plus sine omega t uh, E, sorry, E0. Okay? And there is, there is a final state 1, again for Bob, which is simply unchanged by the whole interaction. That's what it means to be a local interaction. And now I'm going to do. Uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out the state of the atom, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure the atom as it comes. So prepare 
uh, measure, as always. And, and so Atom is effectively going to be out of the game. It's the environment I had to add and it's the one I pull out at the end of the game. Uh, but what's interesting now is if I factor out the G of the Atom, what I get is A00 here, but I get B cos omega t 1, 1. The game is already over here. You can see what I'm going to do now, how to tune the timing to get this guy to be equal to that guy. But of course, I've got another component, which is actually the bad one. That's the excited state of the atom. And if the atom is really excited, which happens with a... So let's write it in the same way that I'm pulling out the states of the atom. So, so this has sine omega t, if you like, inside. And it's got the state 0, 1. So of course I can take the sign out, but I'm just writing it aesthetically, uh, logically, if you like. And here it is. And now I measure the atom in the, in the state either G or E. If I get lucky, and I can tell you the probability to get lucky, it's basically the square of this guy. That's the probability to get unlucky. So 1 minus that is the probability to get lucky. If I get lucky over there, then what, what happens, so if I measure G, imagine I measure G here at the output again. So that means I prepared it in G and I confirmed that it's in G. These are measurements we can do with these four nines that I mentioned before, 99.99% efficiency. There, there's no uncertainty there. Then I'm left with this state of the, of the field. And all I need to do now is make sure that my timing I know the, the coupling usually. What I have to make sure is that my timing is such that this is equal to A, in which case the two coefficients are the same and I've got the maximally entangled state that I wanted in the first place. So this is something that implements with the unitary transformation and next this is the Ozawa style Church of Higher Hilbert Space kind of stuff, but I mean this is what you would do in practice anyway. Um, and I really have created a maximally entangled state, but the price I pay is that there is a chance that the whole thing fails me. And if the whole thing fails me, then I'm left with a completely disentangled state. So now I have to apply Shannon style Kelly betting and see, do I want to go into this game? You know, do I want to risk it? Of course, if you do this many times as you would in an experiment, you will get lucky every once in a while. So again, there is nothing mysterious. You've amplified entanglement but you've amplified it only in one component with some probability. So in a way, and this is how people started thinking about these things subsequently, in a way, you didn't really increase the overall entanglement. Because on average, if you average the disentangled state plus this guy here, you will get at least, at, 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 at most, as much entanglement as before. You cannot really change that. And the logic is, again, that Locally, you should not be able to change uh, these kind of things. In fact, if you do what I suggested here, you will get the highest probability of, uh, of success. Uh, that you can, so you can ask yourself, why don't you do something else? Why don't you set 15 atoms, get them all to interact, measure them in some funny way when they come out, and actually this happens to be the best you can do. It achieves the highest probability. Um, and the probability, so if, if you assume if you assume in this state that A is the smaller coefficient, I mean, strictly speaking, they could be complex numbers, then, then the probability with which, with which you're going to do this is twice mod A squared. And that, in a way, is, you see, this is how, again, people started thinking, well, this is a good way of measuring entanglement. Um, What's the probability with which I can get a maximally entangled state? And the probability is 2 times a squared. So imagine a was 0 to start with. Then you started with a disentangled state, and you can never get any entanglement out of it. So the measure really nicely says that it's 0. The larger a, the higher the probability to get a maximally entangled state. And when a is equal to 1 over root 2, then of course this is equal to 1. You don't have to do anything. You've already started with the maximally entangled state. So the whole range nicely corresponds to what you would imagine should happen in theory. 
And what we now described is the analog uh, of discriminating two non-orthogonal states if I only give you one copy of that. Here I'm giving you one copy, or I'm giving Alice and Bob, I'm giving two cavities one copy. And, and we know that things are not as efficient if you can do something only once than if you can keep repeating this. So if, if, you're really, if you're familiar with information theory, you will immediately say, this guy is wrong. And if someone says, why is this guy wrong? How do you know that? It's not the best you can do. You would say, because it doesn't have a log in the formula. It's got to be a log. I mean, in the asymptotic sense, everything becomes a log in statistical mechanics or information theory. So this guy is wrong, obviously. There is another expression. But I'm never going to be able to derive it bit by bit. I have to engage the whole uh, infinite or large number of, of these pairs. And this is where the, uh, where the field then started to develop. So I, I will tell you a little bit about that. And then I think, I mean, again, the, there is an awful lot to be said about each of these things. And I will try to walk this line between higher level theory and, and low level, I was going to say, and a different level uh, experiment, which I guess is, is much easier to, to understand when you translate it to something like that. Again, the beauty of quantum information is that once you get the whole game, I don't need to present everything as cavities and things like that. Once I've showed you this in terms of zeros and ones, then any system you take will actually be uh, a valid physical system for this kind of stuff. So once you understand qubits in the abstract sense, you can understand everything. Once I went to, uh, incidentally, to Sicily to give a seminar, two to three seminar, and I talk about something. I, I think I talked about geometrical phases. And, 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 um, and the people get up from the audience and two people approach me and they say, we can do what, what, what you're suggesting we can do in Josephson Junctions. And I said to them, I'm actually more of a quantum optician. I have no idea what a Josephson Junction is. And the guy just translated the junction into a qubit. And 15 minutes later, I was an expert on Josephson Junction. Immediately, I became a solid state physicist. Now people think of me as a solid state physicist. After two hours, we actually had a nature paper that was published uh, maybe six months down the line on this very idea that emerged out of that. So it really is a very powerful thing. It allows you to understand quantum physics even better than some Nobel laureates, as I said yesterday. It's a very, uh, very interesting concept. So what I want to do is, is amplify this. And of course, needless to say, if someone gives you two copies, so let's say that Alice and Bob now share two entangled pairs, uh, then uh, things get better already than one entangled pair. But you're not going to start getting logs out of two or three or so on. In order to apply the law of large numbers, you need at least whatever you need, 10 you know, or something like that. 10 is already a thermodynamical limit for a physicist, I would say. So two of these guys, uh, why would this be better? Because I'm not going to do I'm not going to do an operation on this guy and then an operation on that guy. I'm going to use the fact that I can manipulate them jointly. And that's going to be the key. So I'm not going to try to convert this guy into maximum and this guy independently into maximum. If I did that, I'd be having exactly the same logic there. There wouldn't be anything. But now I'm going to allow joint operations on these guys. Of course, again, if you do experiments and you're thinking about this, this is very difficult to do in practice. I mean, even, even two pairs are already reaching the limit of what people can do. But now, you know, we require many pairs, and and uh, and when, once you have many pairs, what you require is some kind of joint transformation on all of these pairs simultaneously. You have to be able to do something like that. The good news of of this whole uh, story is that actually you don't need you don't need to do it on both sides. You, uh, it's enough that Alice does something. Bob can be lazy. And, and basically, Alice can do the full distillation in the same way that Alice, in this case, was the only one responsible for amplifying entanglement. So that, that side of the story uh, goes through. So now, what's the logic? How do they do it? Um, and the way they do it is the following. Think about, think about amplifying uh, many times this entangled state. So here is one pair. Let's write it out a few times just to see what's going what's gonna to happen. Um, and so on. Um, 
So n pairs like that. And and what you can do now is you can you can actually um, you can actually just look at this as a as as a product of all the possible combinations. There's of course an awful lot. There are two to the n different uh, states in this product state. You see, I'm already I'm already expanding this in very much the same way that I was expanding the density matrix that Alice communicated to Bob. And the reason is that if you trace one of these parties out, if you train, you know, if you have a state a0 0 plus b11. And if you chase Alice out, or if you chase Bob out, probably because Alice is doing all the work as usual, I suppose, then a squared 0 plus b squared 1 is the reduction that Alice sees. And now she's got n copies of this guy. And it's very much the scenario where we were imagining that Alice communicates 0 with probability a squared and 1 with probability b squared. And now she's got all the pos possible combinations of n zeros, n minus 1 zeros, 1 1, and so on, the full, the full distribution. Um, and so what does she do? She goes, what kind of measurement does she make? She makes a, the same measurement that she would make to data compress, which is the measurement that gets you to project into a typical subspace. What's a typical subspace? So all Alice sees is a sequence, different possible sequences of zeros and ones. Okay? If she looks at her side, she either has zero or one amplified n times. Okay? So what does she see? Basically, if you look at an individual string, it will just be a, a product of zeros and ones. Okay? There will be some one, some zero, and so on. N qubits on her side and n on Bob's side. How many zeros and how many ones in the limit of large n? And that's the key guy. Well, a squared times n zeros. So this is the, the typical subspace, zeros. And b squared times n ones. Okay. So if you ask how many, what's the size of that subspace? How many different states we have of that type? We've already answered that question. Is 2 to the power of n entropy of this guy? Entropy of a squared, if you like, which is the same as entropy of b squared. So this is minus a squared log a squared. Here is logs, finally. Okay? Minus b squared log b squared. Now I'm already feeling much more happy and relieved. So that's it. And you say, what happens if she's unsuccessful in the projection. Maths tells you that in the limit of n tending to infinity, the probability not to be in a typical subspace goes to zero. You cannot not be in the typical. That's why it's called typical. Of course. So basically, you with unit probability, when you let n tend to infinity, again, I'm avoiding epsilons and deltas. As you let n tend to infinity with unit probability, in some sense, arbitrarily close to unit probability, you will be in this subspace here. That's the size of her subspace. That means she's got that many states available to her. And for every state in this subspace, because the whole thing is a pure state in the limit, there is a state in Bob's subspace. OK? Let's write it down. It's really interesting, actually. So basically, here is the sum. Here is the state for Alice. Here is the state of Bob. OK? Probably I should use some other letter, because I'm going to n is the number of qubits on each side of the game. K. And how many of these vectors are there in the first place? Well, there are 2 to the n times the entropy of A, of these guys. So if you like, the sum goes from 1 to the maximum number, 2 to the n s of A squared. They are all equally likely. So if you really want to normalize a state like this, you'd have to divide it by 1 over the square root of the same number. So this state is nothing but the state 1, 1, plus 2, 2, plus 3, 3, and so on, up to 2 to the n, you know what I'm saying, 2 to the n s, 2 to the n s. 
So she converted it into a maximally integral state. They all have the same probability. Why? Because they're all typical. They're typical. They're all equally likely. And so she's just done one projection that asymptotically, in fact, becomes a unitary transformation. It's deterministic that she's going to get one for large number. And, and she's converted some, many pairs of not maximally entangled state to, to lots of these guys that are maximally entangled. Okay? But now you ask yourself, how many effective pairs are there in a state that I wrote there? And the number of pairs, of course, is n times the entropy of a squared. <coughs> So by making a projection, in a way, she, she, she effectively squeezed all of the information in these qubits, which locally to her looked like this, but after, after the operation, they look like that, maximally mixed. So you can show that that state can be unitarily transformed into a state where you've got this many maximally entangled pairs. How do I know that? Because if, I, if you expand this this many times and collect all the terms, you will get exactly this guy here. You just have to expand it and, and match all the terms. Now it's, it's, it's the same as data compression, but done, done, done with entangled pairs, still locally. So basically the, the game now, and this was really, this was, uh, this was realized by people like Bennett and, 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 and his colleagues at um, at IBM, that if you start um, with, uh, with, with n pairs of non-maximally entangled state, you can actually locally distill at most n times the entropy of this a squared quantity. And therefore, they said, why don't we call this the amount of entanglement of a pure state? So it turns out that it's very, so that's something I want to discuss a little bit. Now, so it turns out that for a pure state, and this now, of course, generalizes to any, uh, to any dimensionality, they could be, uh, they could be D-level systems on each side, if you like. The amount of entanglement in this state is actually equal to the Shannon entropy, or the von Neumann entropy of the reduction. So this is minus A squared log A squared minus B squared log B squared. And the formal proof is exactly like this. That's, that's what they wrote the paper about. Um, so again, does this check out? And you can again check the, so when I kept referring to these guys as maximal entangled states, the quantity I was using to justify that is in fact entropy. You can see that when a squared equals b squared equals a half, I do get one unit of entanglement. People call this one e bit, one entanglement bit in direct analogy with a, with a qubit. And, and, and of course, the other extreme, when one of the coefficients is 0 and the other one is 1, you, you haven't got anything to start with. And this guy is 0 then, which just tells you that you cannot purify any entanglement by local means. So this is a very beautiful generalization of, of Shizan's single pair scheme. And it really gives you now something that you may call a unique uh, measure of entanglement. So after this, I would say uh, the game developed in, in, in a number of direction, in, in a number of different directions. One, one was really, and this is, I think, an immediate thing to, uh, to ask when you see something like that, is why do you only do pure states? Why do you allow Alice and Bob to share pure state? First of all, that's not so realistic. I mean, you cannot prepare a pure state by any means. Um, uh, with, with unit probability. So why not allow the mixed states? What's the game then? And the game then becomes, so in a way, you say, wouldn't it be nice to talk about the entanglement of any state in this way? To say, if you give me many copies in some state sigma, then the entanglement in this sigma is simply obtained by this local compression, and n would go into entanglement of sigma. And the question is, what is this guy? And this is this famous entanglement of distillation. And, and we don't know what it is, actually. We don't have the number for that, uh, for that guy. So already there, when you start to ask these questions, you realize that it's a very difficult uh, open issue. And, and it's, you, know, you, you waste a little bit of time, and then you say, I give up. I can't really answer this question. I think by now, everyone has actually given up on, 
on this issue. So it's still an open, an open problem. And there are, there are of course many other uh, many other notions that are that you can talk about here. Now the one that I want to address a little bit um, is is the following one. There goes the party. I hope you got it in your head. The address actually it's here as well in the circle. So um, the one the one I want to address now is to talk a little bit about the measures we used before and to see whether this entropy makes sense in terms of correlations. I keep talking about entanglement as some kind of extra correlation between Alice and Bob. So the message of Bell's inequalities is they're not just entangled by two, they're not correlated just by two units, which would be the classical one, they are, and they are basically correlated by more than that. And this extra correlation is what you call, what you call entanglement. So, it, you know, are we justified in calling this, in calling this entanglement? Um, Marcelo, I think, reminded me very nicely that the example I gave you with diaries before to justify why you don't have four units uh, in Bell's correlation is even nicer to look at it as, um, as uh, not diary matching but looking for, a, looking for a partner in life. So I guess as a girl, you have a list of things which corresponds to the diary which your boyfriend uh, should satisfy. And you say, okay, you see, is he uh, wealthy, whatever, does he have a good sense of humor, you know, and then no, 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 and then you arrive at something. So basically you go from one person to another, which would be like your database, and you try to check out all of these bits, you know, is he like that? No, okay, I go to the next one. And, and you know, there are six billion people in the world. It's a, it's a really difficult problem to find uh, someone like that. Uh, I, I, actually, of course, no one does that, um, with the exception of computer scientists, probably, in, in, this, in this crazy way. Um, but, you know, it's a difficult problem. And, and Marcelo nicely pointed out that, uh, that if you had four units, you could find this in one go. You would never have to search the whole globe for the right person, for the one and only, but you would find this in one go. So the whole life would really become very uh, boring in some sense, if you find this boring. I don't know. Uh, anyhow, what, uh, what, what happens here is really that when you talk about correlations, then, uh, then, you, then you, can you translate that into mutual information? Because we already have a beautiful way of talking about correlations in classical uh, information theory. So does this make sense? Here I only told you, get rid of these guys, compute the reduced density matrix, take the entropy of that guy and, com and compute it, and that's your entanglement. But it, it's not obvious that this corresponds to, to correlations um, of any type. So what about mutual information? Um, and, and this was a very interesting uh, this was a very interesting question. In fact, interestingly enough, this was already addressed by by, by the physicist I mentioned before, Lindblad. Uh, and Lindblad wrote uh, papers in the 70s where he where he noted something very interesting. And here is what he noted. He said, let me calculate the mutual information between, between Alice, um, Alice and Bob. Uh, and I look at the mutual information. And let's use, let's use the, the usual von Neumann way of computing this mutual information. So let's look at the entropy of Alice. Let's look at the entropy of Bob. And let's look at minus the total entropy of Alice and Bob. That would be the one definition of mutual information. So here again, you will see that two different ways of talking about correlations will actually end up being completely different. Uh, and, and again, that, that's, uh, that's because we are talking about quantum correlations. So, so entropy of each of these guys, entropy of each of these guys is in fact the same because they're in a pure state. So they have exactly the same re reduction a squared 0 plus b squared 1. That's the state of Alice as well as the state of Bob. So these guys add up to the same number, which is twice minus you know, what we had before, a squared log a squared minus b squared log b squared. The total entropy is 0 because I've got a pure state. The total state is a pure state, and as we argued before, this has uh, 0 amount of entropy, so minus 0. So here is your mutual information. And there, I argued from a completely different perspective uh, that, that this guy 
is the amount of entanglement. So the mutual information tells you that somehow you've got twice as much as what you would expect from entanglement. So they lead to the same logic. It's the same number, but it's normalized differently. This guy goes between 0 and 2 instead of between 0 and 1. That should, this should make sense, 0 and 1, in terms of this kind of game there. So Limbaugh, of course, asked himself, um, why is this so? And of course, his logic was that a state like this is not only correlated classically, but it's got an extra correlation, which of course is entanglement. So half of the contribution, if you like, here comes from classical correlations, and it happens to be the same as quantum correlations. So these numbers are the same, which is why you get a uh, factor of two outside of the bracket. So somehow he would say the fact that this is twice as large as what you would expect tells you that there is something quantum mechanical, something funny happening there. And, and if, you, if you now use the other definition of, of correlations, which is the following one, um, how much does the Alice reduce the uncertainty in, in Bob's state by making a measurement? So another way we talked about correlations is how much can I learn about the state of your system by measuring only my system. How much do I reduce the uncertainty? And, and again, initially the uncertainty is this much, but if Alice makes a measurement and she gets zero, she has no uncertainty in Bob's state. She knows it's zero. If she gets one, likewise, there is no, there is no uncertainty. So basically, how much did she reduce the uncertainty by? Exactly by the entropy. So if you take the other, the, other, the other logic of correlations, which is to say entropy before I measure anything minus entropy after, okay? So this is the typical, the typical concept of correlations. You know, when, when Bell talked about it and tried to discriminate this from entanglement, he talked about famous socks of one of his colleagues, high-energy physicists. Um, who is actually a very nice guy, who works in Vienna, Bertelmann is the guy, and there's a paper called Bertelmann Socks that was accepted for publication, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, so basically Bertelmann, and he still does it, I think now he does it for fun because everyone knows that Bell wrote about it. He always has socks of different color. Uh, he's very creative, he, he doesn't use only two colors, he uses all possible colors, more or less. So you don't actually know what the colors are there, but in a sense, in a sense, imagine that he was only using only using two different colors, like red and green, and and you know you look at his uh, you look at his uh, socks, you can't see them because of the trousers, and then you tell him, can you lift one of your legs a little bit up so I can see the color of your socks, and you see red, then you know that the other one is not red, and that's what it means to be correlated. You know, it's green in this simple example. So even though you have a complete uncertainty as to whether it's red or green, the, the, one, of the, one, of the, one of the socks, once you look at the other one, given that you know that the guy cannot possibly match socks, I mean, he's a high energy physicist after all, therefore you know that you have to rule out a certain possibility, okay? And this is a classical correlation. Actually, Bell had a better example which I have to tell you about. His example is the following. He was, he was an Irishman. So you can understand the joke, I guess, uh, once you know that he was an Irishman. He said, imagine the Queen, this is of course the British Queen, visiting Australia and suddenly dying. Now the law says that if the Queen dies, Prince Charles becomes automatically the King. So here is no locality. The Queen has died in Australia, and instantaneously, <laughs> Prince Charles is the King. Okay. Of course, this is just classical correlation. This is because the law says that they should be correlated in this way, just like my socks, correlated or not correlated. And Bell was trying to say that's not entanglement, even though every popular book that you can open says exactly this. They completely miss the, miss the point, always. Hopefully mine will rectify the whole thing, but uh, that's the <coughs> Anyhow, this reduction gives you so I argue the entropy after is zero. The entropy before was this guy here. This way of talking about mutual information 
gives you half of the unit of this guy. So the mutual informations do not generalize when it comes to entanglement. Again, for the same, for the same reason. So you can argue in the following way. You can say, here is a classical way of talking about correlations, just like the SOX, the MONAX, or anything else that is classically correlated in this world. And I'm missing a factor of two. Where is it hiding? Well, it's hiding in entanglement. If you add entanglement, you will get, you will get to this state here twice as much. And this is now the game that people call discord. The difference between the two ways of talking about is something that people call discord these days. Now, um, so, so then you can now start asking the questions. You know, is this is this true for any state that you can imagine? And of course, again, I have to make exactly the same statement that uh, that I made before that. Everything that we talked about here works nicely for pure states. All of this, uh, all of this beautiful logic actually nicely adds up, and you can really attribute different contributions to different things. But once you say, what happens if this is really a mixed state that Alice and Bob share? Then we have a serious problem. So in general, you don't get this this nice factor of two. You don't get this nice entropy of the reduction. And we, in fact, have a serious difficulty how to talk about it. So, so conceptually, with Shannon's theory, we cannot easily address this. And if you talk about a pragmatic approach, something that people call operational, let's talk about squeezing entanglement and so on, I also said you could not really talk about it easily within this context uh, either. So somehow there was a serious issue as to, as to, how, to how to understand entanglement. And I think that's something that I want to at least begin uh, discussing before we before we stop. Um, so I think it emerged very 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 quickly in the mid '90s that we have a that we have a nice way of, of understanding correlations for Q states, and and it all boils down to this factor of factor of two, and I think factor of two again. To rephrase it uh, one more time, is a quantum state is not just correlated in this basis. This basis would be the SOX basis. There would be nothing unusual that when you get zero, the other person gets zero. Okay, it's exactly the classical correlation. But the funny thing about quantum mechanics is that it's equally correlated in a complementary basis. So that's how you can understand that one unit comes from here and one unit comes from here, and that's your mutual information in some sense, speaking speaking very, very, very loosely, even for a physicist, okay? So you shouldn't really take it too seriously. The question then, of course, is what happens with mixed states? And that's when the whole game uh, has uh, um, become really um, much more interesting. Uh, and, and, and I want to at least state the problem. And then we will come back to it and really talk about it in detail. Again, I will try to walk the line between, between a theoretical way of understanding these things. And then I'll show you, uh, if, if you're not completely fed up with the whole thing, how to actually make, uh, make uh, measurements in, in practice and how to confirm these things. So all of this stuff that I, that I talk about, you can actually do in practice with a limited number of pairs. But people are extending this more and more. And one day, maybe we get to 10 in time of pairs. Uh, and more. So with mixed state, the problem was, so which you know, which of these x different numbers of ways is actually the one that's going to give me something fruitful uh, to talk about as a measure of entanglement. Um, incidentally, another generalization here that's that's another game completely is if you go to more than two subsystems, and that becomes equally difficult. Um, for a similar reason that, that, that the subsystem now becomes mixed. So it all goes back somehow to, to the mixed state entanglement. And, and a, a very big thing was, was to realize, and I think this was realized by, by uh, Werner, who said uh, that first of all, you need a good definition of, of what's not entangled. And then anything that's not entangled, you want to, you, uh, you need, so you, basically anything that's not entangled, you want to separate on one side. And everything else, then, by definition, of this type becomes becomes entangled. So this is negative way of speaking about about entanglement. Um, and 
we already from 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 our lectures know that that one good definition of that. There are a little bit subtleties there, and I think it's becoming a little bit more interesting even this game. But a reasonable definition is the state that we had before, that I said can never violate Bell's inequalities. But that's not the main reason why it's disentangled, because Bell's inequalities, I was arguing also, are not are not the ultimate, because they don't detect all entanglement. Um, the ultimate is that I can really prepare this by local operations. So Alice can prepare one state, uh, and then she can phone Bob up and, and tell him to prepare this state. And if Alice averages this over and tosses a coin, then they can exactly on average get this kind of state. So this is something that we call disentanglement. And everything that's not like this is, is by definition, then entangled. And I think Werner, Werner wrote these states down first. I think this was 89. And, and then I remember, so the, 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 the game then became, became interesting because then, of course, you ask yourself, if I give you some general state of AB, how do I know whether it can be written in this form or not? Um, and, and so when I sat down to do my PhD, um, I, was, I was looking for, for basically any mathematical technique that would give me an answer to this question. I, my first, usually what you do in England is you write a transfer report at the end of your first year, which summarizes the questions you'd like to ask for the remaining part of your PhD. And I think I, I wrote down something like six questions. One of them was this kind. Um, I think five of them were answered by people called Korodetsky within the year of when I wrote uh, this down. Fortunately, they left one question for me, I think, more or less, that I managed to answer faster than them. Probably they didn't think about it. Um, anyhow, the question now is really become, and it's a much nicer way than Bell's inequalities, because you delete all the dogma about locality, reality, and it's very confusing because the Bell locality like I said, it's not the same locality that we talked about before, which is, we, there is no problem with that. Um, and the question became a, a very specific mathematical question. And I will develop this really next time when we talk about it. But, but the question was, was, uh, is phrased very nicely like, like this. You've got, a, you've got a set of all possible states, and you've got a subset of these guys which, which are not entangled. Um, I, uh, we actually don't really know what the same set looks like. We know that it's a convex set because when we mix any two physical states, we get another physical state. That comes from axiom number one of grown-up version of quantum mechanics, that states are density matrices. So any linear combination of a density matrix is another density matrix, and therefore it's an allowed physical state. So linearity is encoded there. So now you, 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 you mix. Uh, you know, lambda times rho plus 1 minus lambda times sigma, and you get another physical state. So if you can prepare rho and sigma, then you can toss a coin and prepare the mixture. That's what this is saying. Uh, so that's why I draw them as a convex set. We don't really know the edges of these guys and what it really looks like. This is still an open problem. Now, a subset of these guys are these guys here that have no uh, entanglement. And what you want to determine is whether a given row to you is on this side of the boundary or on that side of the boundary. Okay? And I'm going to make one more statement and then I will stop. So how do, you, how do you solve this problem? So you have a point and you have to determine whether this point belongs to a convex set or not. And and I'm going to say something that's completely obvious to me, and I think every physicist will agree with me. Unfortunately, or not unfortunately, but in mathematics, this is known as the Hahn Banach theorem. And usually, it's something that people dread when they're examined and asked to prove this during their undergraduate exam. It's one of the most intricate proofs of mathematics, the Hahn Banach theorem. Don't ask me why, because I will state it now, and you will say, big deal, I buy it immediately. If you have a point outside of a convex set, here is a convex set of disentangled states. Again, if you combine any two disentangled states, you will get another disentangled state. 
if you have a point outside of a convex set, there is always a line such that the point is on one side of the line and the set is on the other side of the line. Does this sound to you like a theorem? It's obvious. Come on. It takes Hanbanak, lots of single malt scotch whiskies. This guy, this guy Banach, was famous for, for his whiskey club in Poland. He was drinking like crazy and actually proving theorems after <laughs> being complete. He's the only person I know who can actually prove theorems after drinking an amazing amount of whiskey. And I had a notebook uh, with various questions actually that, uh, that they were asking. And one of them was this uh, uh, theorem that actually became the foundation of something that we call functional analysis. It actually invented the whole field in mathematics by playing uh, games like this. So, um, so now again, the statement is that um, if I have a point that doesn't belong to a set, for us this means if I have an entangled set, then I can detect it by drawing a line and saying everything to the right of this line is disentangled, or let's say disentangled states lie on the right side of this uh, line. Of course, in higher dimensions, this is a plane. You're really drawing a plane. And everything on the left-hand side of this is a point. Okay? And what I will have to do next time is, is really show you what this translates to. So this guy, I encourage you to, to read a little bit about Banach just for fun. So he actually didn't do a PhD for a long time. He just couldn't be bothered to write a thesis. He was already a professor uh, in Poland, and they were getting nervous at some stage because we have become more and more formal as time goes on with our requirements for academics. And then his colleagues were saying, look, I mean, this guy doesn't want to do a PhD. How do we force him? He's already a well-known mathematician. It's an embarrassment that our institute didn't give, me, give him a PhD thesis, we, we, a PhD title. We can't just give it to him. What do we do? So one of them, intelligently enough, goes to, goes to Banak and says to him, hey, you're my friend. I've got five problems I can't solve. I'm really desperate about them. And he gives, them five, he gives him five open problems in mathematics. And of course, a few weeks later, uh, Banach comes back and says, look, I've got the solutions to your problems. And the guy says, wait, wait a second, I'll call a few more people, just present it to, to us. And that's it. You know, and he became Dr. Banach. <laughs> it's a really interesting story. So for us, of course, uh, this will have to be translated into something meaningful. And the meaningful statement is, how do I draw a line in quantum mechanics? And, and the line is drawn simply by an operator. So these, these guys are states. This will be some density matrix, if you like, that I call rho AB. This will be this disentangled, or separable, as they call it, set of density matrices. And this will be some Hermitian operator that I'm going to call W because it stands for witness of entanglement. And, and this guy now is going to tell, so of course, you can, it took a long time for, actually for this to be realized and proven formally and so on in the community. But actually, if you think about it, all you ever measure is the expectation value of an emission operator in physics. So that's the only thing you can do. You can measure some operators. And, and what we are going to show somehow is that the trace of this W with respect to entangled states is different in some sense to the trace of W with respect to separable states. And that's your witness of entanglement. But geometrically, it means something like that. And I will translate it also into physical protocols and how to do this. But I stop. It's Friday evening, and we have to party. I think we still have probably time for questions as usual. So fire away. Yes, please. Um, three questions at this